Hi, everybody. Welcome to another edition of the Small Biz Chat Podcast. I'm Melinda Emerson, the Small Biz Lady, America's number one small business expert. And I am so excited to welcome you to another episode of our great show. We have such wonderful experts in the house today. If you want to learn how to really leverage social media selling, you're in the right place. And if you're ready to grow your leadership, one of my guests is going to give you everything you need to know so that you can build what we call unbreakable leadership. Now, really, it's about thinking about what you need in your business for your long-term strategy. If you sell B2B, well, then you better know how to sell on LinkedIn. And I've got the LinkedIn whisperer here who's going to give you all of the tips. And we're going to learn a little bit of LinkedIn etiquette too. And you know something, guys? 50% of all business problems or not so well hidden personal problems. So what does that come down to? That comes down to you, your individual leadership and management style. And so we're gonna talk about how you can evaluate your leadership and how you can get better at it because that should be the goal of any small business owner. Now listen, the Small Biz Chat Podcast is a peer-to-peer -peer mentoring program. We have designed this show to give you advice that you otherwise would have to pay lots of dollars for. And I also wanted to give you information so that you could get it from different perspectives. Now, if you're watching the Small Biz Chat podcast live, you are watching it on my Small Biz Lady fan page or my YouTube channel. Please feel free to leave a comment. Tell us if you have a topic you want us to cover. And if you hear something that is tweetable or shareable, I want to invite you to do that. Because the mission of Small Biz Chat is to end small business failure. We've been doing this for well over a decade. And I am committed to helping you live your dream life as an entrepreneur. Now, Tonight's guests are both very good friends of mine, so I am so excited to have them both. So first, I want to introduce Bryn Tillman. She is the LinkedIn whisperer. She's the CEO of Social Sales Link. And my other guest is Michelle Snow. She is the a business coach. She is a strategist. And she is the CEO of growwithsnow.com. And I love that. So I can't wait to dig in and learn from both of them. And I know that you all will be inspired as well. So with that, let me formally introduce my first guest, Miss Bryn Tillman. Bryn is known as the LinkedIn Whisperer. She is the CEO of Social Sales Link. And for over a decade, she has been teaching sales teams business leaders, and entrepreneurs how to leverage LinkedIn for social selling. As a former sales trainer and salesperson herself, Bryn has adapted all of the traditional sales techniques to what we call this new digital world. She guides professionals to establish a subject matter expert brand, find and engage the right targeted market, and leverage clients and networking partners for warm introductions to qualified buyers. Brynn is also the co-host of Making Sales Social Podcast and the author of the LinkedIn Sales Playbook, A Tactical Guide to Social Selling. For more information, all you have to do is go to socialsaleslink.com. Brynn, welcome. Hey, Melinda. Thank you so much for that uh, introduction, and I appreciate being here with you today. You know, I have to take a point of privilege here. You know, I have known you, I think, almost since the very beginning when I first became the small biz lady. Like, literally, we were like early OGs to, yeah. to, to yeah. social media and social selling. And I think I met you in person for the first time. I want to say it was 13 years ago, we were both at an event because you, you were based in Philadelphia at the time. And we were both speaking at an event for the Philadelphia Business Journal. And you were doing the workshop on LinkedIn. And I was doing the workshop on Twitter. Oh my gosh, right? <laughs> yeah, and you know, it's funny because at the time I thought, ah, Twitter. And then I watched you and I was like, 
oh my gosh, I had no idea it had that much power. And I think you felt the same way about LinkedIn. And we immediately were like, oh, we, I, like I did. I did. And I always laugh because I said, okay, the number one Twitter expert and the number one LinkedIn expert both live in Philadelphia. <laughs> like I felt like, oh, they need to know about it. Right. So I'm so excited that both of us are still in the game. I mean, teaching social media selling and so many other things. And, you know, coming out of the pandemic, one of the biggest things that small business owners were really struggling with was social selling. People, so many small businesses went down because people didn't know how to sell online. People didn't know how to buy ads. People didn't have an email list, didn't know what a sales funnel was, right? You know, so there are all these things that you and I have been you know, talking about for over a decade. And then all of a sudden the world shuts down and the only way people can buy is online. And so I, I really wanted to start it there to really talk about like, you know, how I want to talk to you about your origin story, how you got started, and then how you realized very early on that, that LinkedIn was important. And so I, I really want to kind of understand because I know for me, I read a trade journal in 2007 that said social media was going to be the next big thing in marketing and change traditional marketing. And it was at that time that I said, okay, we stopped doing videos. We stopped doing websites. We started doing social media. And how we learned social media was by building my small biz lady brand. That's how we learn. And that's next thing you know, corporations are calling us, hey, can you come in and consult with our social media team? These people have no idea what they're doing. You know, so literally that is how I I built my company. But I really wanted to, I wanted to know how you figured out that LinkedIn was the magic bullet. Oh, great question. Well, I've always been in sales and sales training. And I love business development. I, you know, I was the traditional, I started, grew up in cold calling and then knocking on doors and, um, you know, in, in the very traditional cold calling. In fact, Philadelphia Business Journal was the event where we met. I used to prospect through the Philadelphia Business Journal. I would cut out articles of CEOs and stick posty notes and my business card on them and mail it to them, right? Like the, all that traditional. And I love sales, not because of all of that work. I love sales because it was helping people and communicating and engaging with people. What I didn't like was the cold calling, but it was part of the game, right? Like there was no other way to set appointments, right? Networking, which I did, and cold calling. So I liked everything except the cold calling piece. And I recall really early on sitting across from a client, staring at his overflowing Rolodex. Uh, listeners, if you are under 50 and you don't know what a Rolodex is, ask your parents. <laughs> um, but staring at this Rolodex, thinking if I could get my hands on that for 20 minutes, I could identify who he knew that I wanted to meet. I could ask for introductions and I wouldn't have to cold call anymore. When I saw LinkedIn, by the way, I called it LinkedIn for at least three months. <laughs> I Listen, don't feel bad. I called Twitter Tweeter. Like when somebody first was trying to tell me about <laughs> Twitter, I was like, what is Tweeter? What are right. you talking about? And I mean, and you know, to then become such a Twitter diva was like hilarious. But trust me, I know exactly what you mean. Oh, yeah. So this LinkedIn thing solved a big problem. It allowed me to search and filter my connections, connections. I had access to my clients' Rolodexes. I had access to my network, networking partners' Rolodexes. And I'm like, this is amazing. I have been asking for this forever. I was so grateful to Reed Hoffman for building it for me, right? Like, I was like, you solved my problem. I love sales. And now I can love 100% of sales because I don't have to cold call anymore. And so I really started then, you know, teaching it for free for a long time. And then, you know, after maybe two years of free, I'm like, wait, why am I doing, like, I'm doing this because 
it was like a loss leader to bring business into my sales training business. And I'm like, this is more valuable than the overcoming objections that I'm teaching people, right? So I ended up launching, I, I, I had a, a wonderful friendship with my a, a partner at the time. And I said, I don't want to do this traditional stuff anymore. I really just want to do this LinkedIn. And so I launched now about nine years ago where I'm solely focused on LinkedIn for business development. And I never look back. It's the greatest thing I've ever done. I Professionally. It. I also have children because that's also <laughs> the greatest thing I've ever done. <laughs> Wait, no, we got to clarify. No, we love our children. but that, And I have a grandbaby and one on the way. Oh my gosh. I am not at that level yet, but I'm, <laughs> trying, I'm trying to get one out of my house into college. But so, so let's talk about LinkedIn though. Why do you think it has become like the number one sales mm -hmm. tool for B2B sellers, especially? But I personally think it can help anyone, but in particular, Folks trying to find decision makers, I don't know a better place to go than LinkedIn. LinkedIn did a brilliant job in building a database, right? Building a database that is self-updating. Individuals continue to update their profile. So it is, whether it was on purpose or not, the most real-time data you'll ever find. There is no other company that could keep up as quickly with the population and the turnover and where people are as LinkedIn does. So that's number one. The database is as clean as any database will ever be. Number two, your email that you own, you don't own LinkedIn, you own your email list. There is 20% turnover year over year. We know that because of LinkedIn. That means one out of five of your emails are going to bounce next year and one of five the next year. LinkedIn allows us to find out where they are. What's the new email? So, so the real-time data is critical. Number two, what did they do right? Because they, they were this networking tool for careers and jobs, it opened up an opportunity for sales. I go back to the Rolodex that no other platform has. You can go into Facebook and look up your Facebook friends and your Instagram followers, and but you can't filter it by job title. You can't filter it by company size. Right? There are so many uh, opportunities inside of LinkedIn to build an ideal list. That is as updated as any list could ever be. And you can see your social proximity to who in your network can help you gain access to those, uh, those targeted folks. So wh why is LinkedIn it? Because that's where your, your prospects are hanging out if you're selling B2B and even B2C, right? That and it is an end executives are there. CEOs are there. I, I mean, Obama is there, right? Like <laughs> I am one degree from Obama, <laughs> like, right? So, so the, the concept that people are attainable through social proximity is also incredibly powerful. So let's talk about traditional selling. Is it dead? Or is it like, is it's it more? Yeah, How is it it's more. So traditional, so it's still about relationships. Where the new way is broken, and I'm really hoping that there's this pendulum that we get back into the middle, is, you know, AI and bots and this, this fake profile outreach garbage, right? Oh. So, oh. Yeah. So gone from um, deep relationships to telemarketing, which I think is the bots of, you know, of phones, right? Telemarketers or to real spam. But social selling done the right way is about being a resource, bringing value to your network. 
building rapport, sharing insights that help to create credibility and trust, earning you the right to get the sales conversation. Right. And yeah. Well, let's talk about that because I feel like the biggest knock on LinkedIn and I, I got to tell you, I, I, it, it's the constant, it's the spam. It's the two seconds after I meet you, two seconds after I accept your connection. And I'm what someone that accepts connections for people that I don't know. But when I do, I'm always like, really, they're going to send me their full pitch, not even two minutes later. And what's really funny to me is I can always tell when they're using a bot on me because the last book that I published with Simon & Schuster, when I put it on my profile, it put Simon & Schuster on my thing. Like it looks like I work for Simon & Schuster. So you wouldn't believe how many emails I get. Oh, I'd love to bring my services to Simon & Schuster. And I'm like, so would I. Like they're just a publisher, you know, but, but again, I'm almost glad mine is like that. So I can tell when somebody's trying to use a bot to communicate with me. So what, I mean, what are some of the cons on, on LinkedIn? I mean, when, when are they going to figure that out and ban it all together? So, you know, the connect and pitch is a bait and switch, and it's really a problem on LinkedIn. LinkedIn tries, you can report them. And if they're reported three times, they will get shut down for 24 hours. And if they're reported again, they will get shut down permanently, but they will pop it to their head somewhere else and some other, right. And some other, it's a, it's a tough thing, but here's the challenge. Number one, I, at one time I did accept everyone. I don't anymore. I reply to everyone. You know, I'll reply and say, hey, Melinda, thank you so much for your connection request. Typically, I only connect with people I know may ask how you found me. And if they don't respond or it responds with a bot, done. If they respond, oh, I saw your content. Great. You're in because you're a human being and you're talking to me. Right. So that's that's been my response to the overflow of, of spam. I the think- other thing is I never connect with anyone cold. I'll engage with their content. I'll, I'll do a little social listening, find out what's meaningful to them. I'll look at our social proximity. How are we connected? And I'll say, hey, Melinda, I see you know Michelle Snow. I'm looking to get in front of her. How, how well do you know her? And do you have any insights you might be able to share? And we have a conversation like, she's awesome. I, you know, we're really good friends. And I'll say, you know, would it be okay if I mentioned we chatted today? Sure. I reach out, Michelle, Melinda Emerson and I were chatting the other day. Your name came up in our conversation. She says, hello, right? Like, let's connect. She's going to accept my connection request. And even though I've done nothing but drop your name with permission, with permission, right? I'm already at a very high level of credibility. And so if we can slow down our outreach just a little bit, we will speed up our our outcome. I like that. I like that. That, that, I think that's tweetable. You said if you slow down your outreach, you will speed up the outcome. Yes. I love that. I'm going to give you credit the first time I say that, Bren, and then I'm going to steal it. I just want you to (laughs) tell you to your face I'm going to do it. It's published, trademarked, but you can use it all you want. (laughs) Now, listen, let's talk about some basic LinkedIn stuff, though. When it comes to setting up a great LinkedIn profile, what what do we like? What do we need to know? Because I see some bad practice out here, too. Well, so it shouldn't if you're in a business development role, you're a small business looking to grow. It should not be your resume. Your buyers don't care about all the jobs you had before the job you're in now that is positioned to serve them. So we need to really make the shift from a resume to a resource. This is a landing page. This is an opportunity for them to test drive you, to experience you. I want the goal of your profile 
for your buyers that visit this profile for them to say, boy, I learned so much here. I can't imagine how great a phone call would be. So how do you do that? Right. The first thing is your headline should not just be your title and company name. It should resonate with your buyer and let them know immediately how you can help them or the solution that you bring so that they know, hey, this is for me and I want to keep reading. So it's who you help, how you help them and your solution in your headline 220 characters. Next is your about section. This is not your mission, your passion, your vision, your years in business. This is literally the challenge your buyers are facing. Vendor agnostic insights, things that get them thinking differently about their current situation where they go, ooh, that's interesting. And then we need to get some, create a compelling moment, right? So I, I resonate, we're resonating with the buyer, we're teaching them something new, and then we're saying, hey, look, if you're feeling this, let's chat. Whether or not we decide to work together, I could provide insights that can help you do X. And all of a sudden, they're like, oh, we took the pressure off. Even if we don't work together, I'm going to help you. And that's the world that we're in today. We have to really detach from what the prospect is worth to us and attach to what we are worth to the prospect. How much value can I bring? If we bring tons of value before the sale, they know that they're going to get value after the sale. So exactly. got, our, our profile has to be positioned to do that. I, I like that. But now, what about, I've seen people take this tactic on LinkedIn where they reach out and they say, hey, I'm trying to do a better job of connecting with the people in my network. Can we schedule a 15 minute Zoom call or, or in-person coffee date or whatever? What is your thought about that strategy? Because I usually say no to that too, because it's usually all the financial planner people trying to talk to me. Um, but I, yeah. I, I usually, like, I don't have any reason to want to talk to you. So, right. no. But, but I just wondered what you thought about that strategy. It, so, you have to earn the right to ask for the call, right? You have to earn the right. My time is valuable. You have to master the ask-offer ratio. The ask-offer ratio is I am asking for time, even if it's time to read my article or watch my video, right? I'm asking you to invest your time at the end of that investment or, in, you know, of each, there's one of three reactions. One, that was a bait and switch. So if you connect with me and then ask me, I just want to get to know my network and I look and I go, you're in sales. That was a bait and so I know it's a bait and switch. Right, right. I know your goal is not to really get to know me. It's to sell me, right? right? Number two is neutral. We connected, you ignored me, I ignored you, or just, right. It doesn't hurt, but it doesn't help grow your business. Right. Number three is compelling. We've got to get to a compelling, when we master the ask offer ratio, the time you invested in whatever I asked you to invest in, what you got more value than you value your time. So you got an ROI, a return on investment of your time. If you get $500 an hour for coaching and you just spend 10 minutes, it better be worth more than 60 bucks in my head, right? Whatever it is, like I, I'm not good at that. But there's an ROI in that. It, there's a mental ROI. So if you're asking for 15 minutes of my time, you need to have already earned that right with mastering the ask offer ratio prior to the ask of a call. So how do you do that? Well, there's a few things. Number one, we can ask for their opinion on things. Now that may seem backwards, but... If we value their insights, they believe investing their time in voting on a poll, on sharing in a comment their thoughts, believe it or not, that's worth a lot to them. 
emotionally, we made them matter. We cared about their opinion, number one. Number two, provide insights. And I, that's the order I do it. I really slow it down. I connect. I ask for their subject matter expertise in a, usually a one-click vote on a poll that I have running. Or, you know, I, I, I posted this question as a CEO. I'd love your, your thoughts and comments. I appreciate the company you've built and the things that you've done. And your thoughts can really help my, my network. They are honored. Then I'll say, hey, I'm not sure if you're exploring X, Y, and Z, but if you are, I've got this ebook I'd be very happy to share with you. Let me know if you're interested. I'll send you a link. Now, notice what I did. I never send a link without permission. It Number one, it creates FOMO, fear of missing out. If I don't have the link, I'm never going to have the link. If you just send me the link, I could go back to the link anytime. So I don't have the link. Number two, you respected my inbox. You can send me this link and I don't feel spammed anymore. Right? So it, and now when they say yes, and if my content is of great value, which it needs to be, or it won't work, I have now mastered the ask offer ratio again. And now I may have earned the right. If, if this resonated with you, if you have any questions around this topic, I'm happy to jump on a 15-minute call. Let me know if that would be valuable to you. Right. Not to me. Right. Would it be valuable to you? That's the difference. Yes. So one of the other things I notice about LinkedIn lately is probably once or twice a week, I'm contacted by some LinkedIn automation firm that would love to help me get 10 to 30 leads a week from their activities through my account. <laughs> and I know the answer to this, but for the sake of my audience, will you talk about, you know, automation, good thing, bad thing, you know, tell me about it. So first it breaks LinkedIn's user agreement 8.2.2. You can get shut down. You are scraping personal data. You are not allowed to do that according to LinkedIn. Now, these, these firms will tell you, oh, we sued LinkedIn and we won. And you know what? They're right. Their company is legal. As a user, you've agreed not to use them. Oh, okay. So it's a very interesting dynamic. And believe me, LinkedIn is shutting people down for using it. So that's number one. Number two, would you send a robot to a chamber of commerce networking event to build relationships? I wouldn't. No, no, I would never do that. So why are we doing this online? The, there is a human being on the other side, not a lead. Oh, you know, when we start thinking of lists of people as, you know, we put dollar amounts on them. It's so broken. When we put our commission over the needs of our buyers, it's broken. And when we think there is an easy button for me to make money, it's broken. I am going to tell you, I know almost no one that has gotten success what are they calling a lead? Is a connection a lead? I mean, a lead to me is someone that I've talked to, I've uncovered a challenge that they're facing, and that I have a solution that may be able to solve that problem. Until that, there's no lead attached to them. And so all of that is broken. All in my opinion, even in the sales world, that's broken. You know, even in my CRM, when it says add a lead, it makes me cringe. In Sales Navigator, when it says lead list, it makes me cringe. It's really a list of my ideal persona that I'd like to start a conversation with that if, in fact, there's a need, may become a lead. 
I love it. I love it. Well, listen, we've got to take a break, but when we come back, we're going to talk about LinkedIn Sales Navigator and some of the other tools that LinkedIn offers to help you sell. I'm Melinda Emerson, the Small Biz Lady. You're watching the Small Biz Chat Podcast, and we will be right back. Are you ready to become a boss? Hi, I'm Melinda Emerson, Small Biz Lady. Click the button below and take my free boss quiz. This assessment will help you learn your entrepreneur type and find the right business model for you. Get this information about the number one asset in your business. Yeah, that's you. Hi, everybody. This is Melinda Emerson, the Small Biz Lady. Welcome back to the Small Biz Chat Podcast. I'm talking with expert Bryn Tillman, and we're talking about all things LinkedIn. All right, Bryn, I get this question a lot. Is it worth paying for LinkedIn? And if you do pay for LinkedIn, should you just pay for Navigator? Is it worth having a premium account? Give us the deal. So if you are in a business development role or you have someone on your team in a business development role, I believe it is the most effective sales tool available to us today. However, it's like a gym membership. What do I mean? We sign up, we show up for three or four weeks, and then we stop going, but we keep paying. So we have to make sure that if we are going to get a sales navigator, that we're going to have a plan, that it's part of our sales and marketing strategy. It's not just a a plugged-in tool, but there is a real strong strategy around it, an approach um, that's trackable that uh, allows us to see successes uh, so that we can a- we can A-B test things and make sure that our outreach is, su- is successful. There are so many tools out there for sales, whether you're talking about a CRM, which obviously is an important tool, or you're talking about like a sales loft or, you know, where you have um, cadences every single day to do. But Sales Navigator has a few things that no other tool in the entire world has. Number one, it's got LinkedIn's database. <laughs> right. Number two, it has some of the most powerful filters to allow us to truly identify exactly who in our network, it, it that you know that who they are, where they are, what industry they're in, um, if they've been active on LinkedIn in the last thirty days if they've shared content in the last 30 days, if um, they've changed jobs in the last 90 days. Like we can go so granular into the data like that LinkedIn has through Sales Navigator. It can really help us um, zone in on exactly the types of people that we want to have conversations with. And that's part of it. So, yeah. so what is the best way to learn how to use Navigator, Brent? Because Navigator is tough. I feel like that's almost a softball or maybe, I'm not sure. The best way is to hire us. No, but I mean, look, look, Sales Navigator, they have training. They have, like when you go on, they have mini videos. They take you through some training. And they teach you the features and the benefits, but they don't teach you the strategy. And so you may identify a very specific, you'll say, oh, I love this list, but how do I approach it? How do I engage them? One of the things we can do in Sales Navigator is take inventory of our existing connections. So now I make a list in Sales Navigator of all the perfect people I'm already connected to that I've been ignoring. And now what? Right? What do we do with it? So that's where, you know, so how do you learn that? Where do you learn that? Well, you can go go listen to my podcast, Making Sales Social. That'll help. Um, but I'm just going to give you a... a how do you, what do you do with them? Put out a poll and ask them to vote. Put out a piece of content and ask them for their, their comment. People are absolutely honored when you put out a, if I reached out and I said, hey, Michelle, as, a, as one of the best business coaches in all the land, I would love your one-click vote on a poll on what do executives really need to learn? 
right? And 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 she'd be like, wow, that you know, she thought of me. And yes, because she is, but now I'm gonna actually reach out in that case, maybe to all of the business coaches that I'm connected to. Michelle is still the best, but all of the business coaches I'm I'm connected to and ask them a similar question as a top business coach in my network is probably how I'd say that. I'd love your one click vote. Now it's almost a discovery ish question, Mm -hmm. but I could get hundreds of votes on a poll that can help me start a conversation with my ideal persona. And it can help me identify who's worth talking to now. And you know, move on with that. Like, hey, thanks for voting on the poll. I was so surprised to see what your your colleagues are voting on. I'd love to share those results with you and tell you a little bit about where you benchmark among your peers. If you're open and you think that would be helpful to you, let's set up a call. And so, you know, but it's about them. It's not about me and my solution. Sure. But let's talk about your, your, you have this group, right? Social sales link and people mm-hmm. can pay and you do these like live hot seat LinkedIn, like you get into Navigator and show them how to do stuff. Yeah. Please talk about that because I just think that is so cool. I've sent you so many people, clients of mine. I don't try to teach people LinkedIn. I send them to people who know LinkedIn. So I, I think that it's important to talk about because I think it's a very affordable resource. Well, thank you. Yeah, it's it's a dollar for the first month and then $97 a month. And we have two Are you coaching ready to become every, a boss? It's dropping Hi, I'm Melinda every Emerson, single small week. biz lady. And people come in and they ask their question. They're on the hot seat. They quiz. share their screen. This assessment will help they you get your my thoughts and the thoughts and of the, the right community. Business Our community is extremely get this information about um, the strong. And they'll say, hey, I tried this and it didn't work. Or I did this and it did. And so we get a lot of support beyond just my team answering questions. And and it's great. And we have some people that are on every single call and that's their hour that they're doing emails in the background listening and pop in and ask their questions. We have some people that, I have someone who pays every month and about every three or four months, she jumps on, she asks a question about a specific prospect. We write her template. She goes out, she closes business and doesn't come back for three or four months, but she is like a $40,000 sale that we helped her get through. So yeah. it, it's really about, you know, what makes the most sense for each person, but we are there supporting now hundreds of, of uh, members and it's really fun and there's no commitment. They could pay, you know, they can leave, they can come back, whatever they want to do. Love it. Love it. All right. Now, Brent, what is the best business advice you've ever received? From you, write a book. <laughs> we were, I don't know if you remember, we were sitting in King of Prussia in, um, oh gosh, it was a, a, a it, there's two restaurants next to each other. It was Maggiano's. an Italian restaurant and then a bakery. Maggiano's. Maggiano's, but it was the bakery next to it. And we were sitting in a booth and I said to you, Melinda, how do, what do I do now? And you're like, write a book. And I said, how do I do it? And you gave, spent about 15 minutes and six months later, I published my book and it was the best thing I ever did. All right. Well, I love hearing that. I, I don't even remember telling you that. So wonderful. I'm glad that I gave somebody some business advice that they you actually don't... even introduced me to the person that put, I put my first book together. Oh my gosh. I, I don't even remember. Someone in the South, Carolina, maybe, or North Carolina. I have to remember it, you know. It's yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. You, you set me up with her. She was amazing. She laid out my first book. Yeah. So awesome. there you go. Awesome. 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 I love it. I love it. Well, listen, thank you so much, Bren. Your advice has been invaluable. Anybody who didn't get something about LinkedIn that they could use now that they didn't know before they listened to this podcast. Shame on you because Brent is the truth. Listen, when we come back, we're going to talk about leadership and how to become a better leader in your small business. I'm Melinda Emerson, the small biz lady, and we'll be right back. Hi, I'm Melinda Emerson, Small Biz Lady, and I want to welcome you to Small Biz Lady University. Our mission here is to end small business failure. So all of the courses here are about two things 
how to become your own boss, or how to make money online. So that's what we do here. So whether you wanna learn about email marketing and sales funnels, or you're ready to get started with social media selling, or if you're really just getting started with e-commerce, you might wanna jump into our How to Sell and Market Online course. Either way, if you want to learn how to become your own boss and do it well, I have everything you need here at smallbizladyuniversity.com. If you have any questions or have any technical problems getting signed up, just email us at support at melindaemerson.com. Take care. Welcome back everybody to the Small Biz Chat Podcast. If you're joining us on my Facebook page, thank you for joining and following my Small Biz Lady page. We're also broadcasting live on our YouTube channel. If you hear something you like, leave us a comment or better yet, subscribe. Now to my next guest, her name is Michelle Snow. And I have to tell you, she is a seasoned business coach who helps small business owners achieve championship-like success. She is a philanthropist, an award-winning trainer, speaker, and executive consultant who helps her clients grow their leadership to grow their business. She is the CEO of growwithsnow.com, a professional and leadership development firm based in Philadelphia. And after recovering from a diagnosis of sarcoidosis, Michelle has dedicated herself to coaching and mentoring young and mature entrepreneurs to live their dreams. Michelle's been featured in Forbes, the Philadelphia Inquirer, The Ladder, and many other media outlets. For more information, go to growwithsnow.com. Michelle, welcome. Thank you, Melinda. I'm so happy to be here. Oh my gosh, I am so happy to, to have you. And I, and I have known you for many years, so I'm excited. I know this story, but my listeners don't. So tell me, how did you build Grow With Snow? How did you, how did you become... A, a world-class executive consultant and, and trainer and coach. Well, Grow With Snow um, is a newer business for us. Um, nine years ago, I started working with young adults and then we morphed into um, working with corporations. However, during the pandemic, <laughs> everything changed, not just for me, but for most people, right? And so at that time, January, February 2020, all of my contracts, and shame on me, but all of my contracts were live, right? All of this big personality was either at a corporation or at a school. And so my, um, my magic was in working directly in person with our clients. Well, <laughs> in, in March, guess what? Every contract was paused or suspended or canceled. So I probably had a complete and total meltdown. <laughs> and in the midst of trying to save my life and save my mind and save my business, and of course, being completely and utterly devastated, um, I grabbed my phone and just started powering through the streets of Philadelphia. And it was a safe place for me because people trusted my brand. They trusted my social media. They trusted my journalism. And so I'm going through the streets of Philadelphia, covering the damage, covering the rioting, covering busted windows, talking to owners who were in tears, speaking to people on the corners who were literally, without exaggeration, just wandering aimlessly, taking pictures of the boarded sneaker stores. And if, if I was to just go a little bit deeper into detail, there was one sneaker store in particular, Melinda, where <laughs> they were literally in there still stealing, right? With bags and book bags and just taking out whatever they wanted, glass everywhere. And if, if anyone here is familiar with Philadelphia, one of the biggest churches in Philadelphia is Enon. And the pastor was doing the same thing. So we were walking the streets of Philadelphia. I'm sharing that background because that was when I felt the strong urgency to laser focus, to lean in. And here is where I could be most effective working with small business owners, storefronts to help them to recover. And that summer, we literally grew and opened Grow With Snow. Now, people um, have heard me say that for years, but Grow With Snow, it was a mantra. It was a tagline. It wasn't a business. 
but we moved it and focused on small businesses that summer and I haven't looked back. I love it. I love it. So why do you think leadership is so important? Because sometimes leadership has to pivot, right? You had to pivot your leadership. Why is leadership so important for business success? Well, if you don't, if you don't lead, then what are you doing, right? I mean, you have you have to be in position where number one, you have the strength, the character, the, the know-it-all to lead not only yourself but to others. You have to have that like factor, you have to have that courage factor. And with leadership comes vision, right? We know scripture tells us without a vision, the people perish. So you you can't just have grit. You can't just have tenacity because that's necessary too. The leadership and the vision is a necessary skill for you to get to where you're going. So what do you think makes a leader, a great leader, highly effective? (laughs) Well, character, character. If I didn't say it, Melinda, I'm going to say it again. Character. Um, I have had the pleasure of working with some of the best and some of the most awful. Um, More recently, we work with the client and their mindset, their culture and their business was, I'm going to give you a task, either get the task done or get out. Now, I get that, that time is money. The challenge was there was no protocol for how to <laughs> onboard your team, right? There was no system as to make sure that there was accountability. There was no check-in for understanding. It was just this mindset of just do it the way I say it and get rid of them. Now, here's the, here's the problem that they had after that. Constant rotation. Now, you and I know if you're constantly hiring and you're constantly firing, what does that mean to your bottom line? Well, it costs you three times as much to replace that person. Plus, if you're constantly going through churn, usually that means you don't have a clean hiring process. Like you don't have a clear job description. You aren't interviewing multiple candidates. Basically, you're going with the lowest lowest dollar person you can get and then getting mad when they don't, don't um, you know, They can't perform. But if you don't take the time to train people in how it is you want them to do it and give them a proper onboarding time. I mean, I talk about this all the time. People throw people the keys and say, good luck. Right. You know, they don't you know, and small business owners everywhere are notorious for this. It's like we got to get a little bit more uniformity to this, like big businesses when it comes to hiring people, because really nowadays people are loyal down to the last dollar. And a core employee is actually somebody who's only been with you two years. That's now a core employee because of how much people are moving around. So people who are employees have options, right? So you have to be good to your people. And I don't know that everybody gets that. And and, and I'll share in this particular client that I'm referring to, it took a lot of work to begin to shift their mindset because we're not talking, this particular client was not a mom and pop. Um, they were not broke. They were not struggling for income. They were, a, they are, I should say, um, a multi-million dollar company and cash is not an issue, right? So they were unable to see how much money they were losing because like, their business is kind of raining in cash, right? Uh-huh. Yeah. So it wasn't until I kept stressing and emphasizing like, hey, you, we've got to get you some infrastructure so that you can keep people longer. Finally, they came back, I think it was 90 days later and said, I get it. And thank you. And now they retain, <laughs> hallelujah and amen, they retain their team. So leadership is very important. It's critical. It's a key. You must be visionary. Um, you can't have one without the other. So I know that you specialize in teaching people how to create what you call unbreakable leadership. Can you define that for us? Tell us what that means. Well, I found that it's okay to bend, right? It's okay to bend. It's oh, it's okay for you to become and feel a little disjointed. That is a part of the process. The challenge is 
people don't have any root to stand on. They don't have they don't have a team that they can trust. They don't have the God factor. And so what happens often is in, in true story, I have literally seen people crack. They have had mental breakdowns. They have literally without question temporarily even lost their minds. And it's so sad to me, that breaks my heart that people have gotten so low and so frustrated and desperate in their business and their cause to be great and to be successful that it took everything away from them. So we created unbreakable leadership, number one, to motivate and encourage people that it's okay that you may sway a bit, but we you don't have to crack in this business. How do you do that? One, you get a network of people around you that you can trust, right? Because that's one of the first areas why people break. They stay in relationships that are too long. The, the relationship in business becomes toxic. There becomes this hate. And then it becomes a bitterness. And when you have all of those um all of those keys running together, that is a recipe for complete disaster. So one of the ways to, to become unbreakable is to know your network. The next part is you've got to know when to say no. <laughs> If you're a people pleaser like me, Melinda, I do. I, I get it. I'm an only child. I'm an Aquarius, right? I'm, I'm high energy. I love to please you. But when you can't pull back, when you cannot say no, you overextend yourself, guess what? Then you crack because you're burning at both sides. You're overwhelming your capacity. And then you can't, you're, you're unable to do anything. So between the God factor and knowing those key elements, that's a big part of being unbreakable. So... I know that you talk a lot about leaning on your faith and, and I, and I am a believer and that's something that I believe in too. Uh, you know, one of the most powerful things any entrepreneur can do is pray over their business every day. Why do you think that's a key element of business success? Well, nowadays this, the secret is out, right? I mean, a lot for years, we thought that success was magic or people were smarter or better or had more experience, right? Like, oh, I'll never be as successful because they're smarter or better. They have more money. We found out through so many studies and surveys and stars and celebrities, they're now telling everyone that they are applying um, affirmations. They are pr prayerful in the morning. They're getting up early um, and they're trusting a source higher than themselves. It's really important because <laughs> I don't care how successful you are, you will hit a wall where you will not know the answer, where you will feel completely overwhelmed, you'll be and feel absolutely alone. And, and, and if we were just to go a little bit more deeper with authenticity, you'll have a moment where you'll feel like shattered pieces. My aunt told me one time that she was going through in her life and when she came home, she felt like if she took one more step, she was going to fall to pieces all over the floor. And having your God-like factor, having your higher, high, high, excuse me, having your higher power, it centers you. It grounds you. It gives you something to give you courage and to give you hope. And quite frankly, I don't see how anybody can make it without having something bigger than themselves. I, I think I agree with you. Um, we're going to go to break. And when we come right back, we're going to talk more with Michelle Snow about how to evaluate your own leadership to grow your business. We'll be right back. Are you ready to become a boss? Hi, I'm Melinda Emerson, Small Biz Lady. Click the button below and take my free boss quiz. This assessment will help you learn your entrepreneur type and find the right business model for you. Get this information about the number one asset in your business. Yeah, that's you. Welcome back, everyone. You're watching the Small Biz Chat Podcast. I'm Melinda Emerson, the Small Biz Lady, your host. And I'm here with Michelle Snow. And she was talking to us. She was dropping gems about leadership and whole leadership, not leadership in one aspect of your life, but leadership in throughout all aspects of your life. And, and I was so inspired by what she was saying. But Michelle, I want to switch gears with you just a little bit, because one of the things I wanted to ask you about is coaching. And do you believe that every small business owner needs a coach? There's always an area in your business or in your personal leadership skill set 
that you can be better in, right? Some businesses are brilliant, right? We've met the business owners that are great at finances, they're great at sales, or they're great at customer service, right? But they may be they may be lacking in their approach for their team. There's going to be something where there's a gap where they can be better. And I believe that every business owner needs a league of coaches. Find people who are good in their lane to help you with that thing, right? Because just because you are a good coach in finances doesn't necessarily mean that you're a great coach in team building. So if you really want to continue to grow to the next level, Find a niche coach to help you in every particular area. I know for me, <laughs> I have about seven. I have about seven coaches, and one of them is on the line right now. <laughs> Don't tell nobody about that. But anyway, listen, when you're thinking about bringing in a coach, what are some of the things you need to think about or some of the questions you need to ask? I love that you asked this question because this is one of my hot buttons. First of all, you want to get a coach. Who does more than just coach, right? Now, let me clarify what that means. If all your coach does is sell, right? If all they do is go on and book you in their classes, but you can't find their business, they have no other acumen, all they do is book you, like you, you're the business. <laughs> They've got no skill set. People aren't better. They're just booking you in classes. I am, I am, that is a big source spot for me. Run, right? If you find the coach that is not coachable, they refuse to take wise counsel. That is another red flag you want to run. If you find a coach who refuses to let you talk, <laughs> run, right? They've got all the answers, but they haven't heard anything. And here's one of my favorites. I've got 32 more, but I know we're out of town. Time. Here's my favorite. The coach that believes that coaching is texting. Yeah, I, yes, yes, Melinda, go ahead, go ahead. I have seen that where clients, well, I should say prospects, have called me and said, my coach just texts me. Do you actually have conversations with your clients? <laughs> Let me just go ahead and say, run, baby, run, <laughs> and run some more. Wow. Wow. I, you, you have said so much there and you were right. We're just about out of time. So I have one more question for you. What is the best business advice that you have ever been given? I think you gave us some, but what's the best business advice anyone's ever given you? Yes. Um, one of my coaches gave me the best advice that I use all the time. Listen to lead. Listen with empathy, with compassion, and with all of your authenticity, and then respond. And that has been our secret sauce. I love it. I love it. Thank you so much. You have really inspired me. You made me laugh. You made me chuckle. You made me think about things that I hadn't thought about in a long time. And I'm sure you have inspired my listeners. Now, what I want to do right now is bring back Brent Tillman. And I want to ask both of you guys some really quick questions and what we call our hit it and quit it panel. So how this works is I'm going to ask both of you the same question and you have to answer in 30 seconds or less. And if someone takes your question, takes your answer, you got to come up with something else or you're going to get the cowbell, right? So that is how this works. So Bryn, come on back in. We're so happy to have you back. And here is the first question. What is your favorite podcast? Bryn, I'm going to come to you first. What is your favorite podcast? Masters of Scale. Awesome sauce. Who's the host of it? Do you know? Reed Hoffman. Reed Hoffman. Love it. Of course, right? The, the guy that invented LinkedIn. <laughs> of course, that's your favorite podcast. Michelle, what's your favorite podcast? <laughs> Oh gosh. Unfortunately, I've been on YouTube listening to all the to audio books. So right now I'm just reading the secret, the secret millionaire. So I, I don't have one. I'm just on YouTube all the time. <laughs> Listen, that is perfectly fine. As long as you're getting nourishment and, and information some kind of way. All right, Michelle, this question is coming to you first. What is your favorite business app? Oh gosh. Um 
I'm always putting the spot with these things, but I'm going to just say it's my, it's my CRM, which is Kartra. Excellent. Bren, what is your favorite business app? I think I know the answer to this, but what is your favorite business app? <laughs> Not platform. Uh, and it would be Calendly. Mm. Like it, like it. All right, Bryn, this first question is coming to you. What is your favorite old school marketing tip? Favorite old school marketing tip. Oh my gosh. Um, never have more than one call to action. You'll confuse people. I like that. I like that. That is a good one. And we haven't heard that one in a very, very long time. All right, Michelle, what is your favorite old school marketing tip? Well, I still I still love the power of picking up the phone and saying hello and checking in on my customers, right? Just a good old fashioned phone call. <laughs> Listen, that is powerful. I, that is powerful. I completely agree with you. All right, ladies, here's your final question. What is the best business book that you have ever read? Best business book you ever read. Bren, I'm coming to you first. Can I say three? Yes, but you're only supposed to say one. But for you, yes. Okay, so I'll start with the first one and then you can leave it at that if you want. Endless Re Referrals by Bob Berg. He's also the, the, the author of The Go-Giver, but Endless Referrals, huge. Number two, um, The Challenger Sale by Matt Dixon and Brent Adamson. And number three, The Little Black Book of Connections by Jeffrey Gittimer. I like Jeffrey Gittimer too. He's a good guy. All right, Michelle, favorite business book you've ever read? The 12 Universal Laws of Success, my absolute favorite. I read it. I've read it about 10 times. Herbert Harris, top favorite. <laughs> love it. Love it. Now, I have to tell you guys, my favorite business book right now is Disrupt You by Jay Samet. And I love that book because he says, if you want to disrupt the world, start by disrupting yourself. That is why I love that book. Listen, ladies, I appreciate you guys so much. This has been such an amazing conversation we have had today. Um, thank you to my guest, Bryn Tillman, the LinkedIn Whisperer. Check out her group at socialsaleslink.com. And I want to thank leadership expert and business coach, Michelle Snow. If you're interested in working with her, all you got to do is go to growwithsnow.com. And if you're interested in learning about what kind of boss you are or could be, go check out my new quiz. It's called bossquiz.com. And it'll give you a detailed profile on who you are as a business leader and what kind of business might be the right business for you to start. And right now it's free, so you better go jump on it and go to bossquiz.com. Thank you all for joining me for another episode of the Small Biz Chat Podcast. If you're still working on your digital pivot, don't forget to head over to our online school, Small Biz Lady University. We've got lots of courses there to help you finally start generating the money you deserve. And with that, I just want to leave you with, I really love serving you guys with the Small Biz Chat podcast. My mission is to end small business failure. And I want to leave you with this. You never lose in business. Either you win or you learn. God bless everybody. Good night.